number two. Luke chapter two, and please stand if you would as we read God's word together today. Luke chapter two, as we are continuing our Christmas story, uh, like maybe we've not looked at before. Last week we looked at the name of Jesus and how that's how the Christmas story began with the announcement that Mary would bring forth a child, a son, and his name would be Jesus. And how that name is recognized in heaven and earth and underneath the earth. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one in his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there was at the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for we have this promise that you would come forth born of a virgin. And Lord God, that you come to redeem mankind from his fallen state. And not only redeem us from our fallen state, but from all the curse of the law. For you became a curse for us. For the scripture hath declared that cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessings of Abraham would come up on your people. Now fathers we stand here in this place. We say thanks and we honor you today. Let us be like the old uh, hymn that lo let us come and adore you. Father we thank you Lord God for this time. And Father, as your word goes forth, I pray that it will do as it is set forth this morning. Father, allow me to minister this word as you have given it to me in my spirit, Father, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated. You know, if I went around this room, and I was to ask each individual in this room what worship was, I would get many different answers. And worship sometimes is very hard to explain or to describe. The 
there is so much of what worship is. But just as it is hard maybe to describe, I can tell you some things that worship is not. Worship is not a church service. However, worship should be part of every church service. It's not always even singing songs that one can say that we have worshipped. Because quite frankly, not every song that's sang or sung in churches actually even glorifies God or even mentions God for that matter. But even the songs that are on point and on focus and point towards Jesus, even when those are sung, it doesn't mean necessarily that we have worshipped Heavenly Father. See, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 7 and 8, He said, you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, these people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Worship is a matter of the heart, not a matter of lip service. In the late 80s, there was a group by the name, no, uh, went by the name of Millie Vanilli. You younger people have no clue who I'm talking about. But those that know who Millie Vanilli is, you'll know what I'm about to tell you, that they were a, a German duo that rose to fame very quickly. They had their first album, and I know some young people watch an album. Their first album was six times platinum, producing three number one hits that stayed at the chart for nearly 42 weeks. Millie Vanilli even received a Grammy as the uh, great uh, for a Grammy for the best new artist had songs like "Blame It on the Rain," girl, you know it's true. Who, <laughs> girl, you know. But the problem with all that sounds so good. But in reality, they were honoring. They were lip. Sinking. They weren't even singing the songs. Now they looked good. They they had a they had an 80s look and man, they had some good dance moves, I tell you. And we can do just like Millie Vanilli. We we can come in and have all the right dance moves. We can we can lip sync to the words. We 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 can know them, but yet we and we, and we many times we're just honoring God with our lips and our heart. Is far from him. Jesus told this woman at the well in John chapter 4. She said, he, they, they got into the debate of worship. Worship is one of the biggest debates. It's one of the things that cause most division in the house of God today. And I was flat footed told uh, by two men uh, that, that, that uh, I respect their uh, authority, I respect their opinion. They were flat-footed, told me that, that me trying to do hymnals and contemporary worship in the same setting, I was sitting on a powder keg and it one day would explode on me. But I believe that that's out of line completely with Scripture as we will see later today. But Jesus told this woman that got into the paid and she said it's in the mountain we worship and you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, you don't even know what you're talking about, girl. You don't even know what you're, we know what we worship. You don't even know what you're talking about. But I'm going to let you in on something, young lady. There's a time coming that you won't even worship in the mountain. They're not going to worship in Jerusalem. They're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the Father seeks such To worship Him. And friend, I'm telling you, we miss the greatest part of the Christmas story when we do not worship God. There they was. And all of a sudden, the angelic host came. And and they began to magnify God. It wasn't lip service. The heavens rolled back. And I believe when you and I get in an atmosphere of not lip service, but that of pure, pure worship that comes 
from the heart, from, from the spirit. I believe that heaven will roll back. I believe that you and I can walk under an open heaven just like Stephen did. But I believe the key is that of worship. Now, misunderstand me, nothing, and I mean nothing, takes the place of the Word of God. But I tell you, the Word of God is enough to cause a man to worship God. They must worship. They must. They must. They must worship Him, God said. Jesus said they must worship me in spirit, in truth, and all else is just no more. And let's go back and what Jesus called these very religious people. He called them hypocrites. Why were they hypocrites? He said because they honor me with their mouth. But their heart is far from me. I wonder how many hypocrites are sitting in churches all across the land today. Because we honor God with our mouth today. Let's just get real personal. Let's just get it right here to home. How many of us just gave him lip service today? And you say, well, all these kids. And now, you know how to handle that? Close your eyes. I, I can remember, I learned that lesson a long time. If I want to get into real wor- worship, you've got to close your eyes anyway. I don't care if there ain't a kid in the building. I don't care if it's packed with kids like this one is. I say let them loose. Loose them and let them go. Come on now. My God, they're not going to hurt nothing or nobody. We do well to start acting like them. Amen. Amen. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hath God perfected praise. Somebody said, well, they don't. Somebody told me one time they're not here. They're not here now. They said, well, them kids don't understand what's going on. I said, well, how in the world do you know what they understand? How do you know? So, I want us to look at Christmas. I, 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 like, I want us to look at Christmas in a whole other light because, I, quite frankly, folks, we, 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 we as the body of Christ, we have been duped into the commercialization of Christmas just like the world. We have been duped into the hustle. We've been duped into the bustle. We, we've been duped into just everything. And listen, I'm not a, listen, this, this a disclaimer. I'm not opposed to Christmas. In the, I, I'm, who could be opposed to giving gifts? And who could be opposed to gathering with family? And, I mean, who, who could be opposed to it? But I'm talking about we do all that and we've left Jesus out of our Christmas story. And I think we have to, Take this time of this, this season, this time of the year, and begin to really look at really what happened that morning or that night when Jesus was born. And I, I know you get people say, well, he wasn't born December the 25th. He probably wasn't. He probably was born sometime in September. Who knows? We don't, we don't know. I mean, those are, those are things that Paul told Timothy to stay away from. But what I can tell you is these Men heard from an angelic host about this child being born. And it caused them to worship. See, the thing about worship, as we look to this night, as these shepherds were just minding their own business. Now, let's see if you can, just use our imagination that God gave us. Here these shepherds are out in an open field. There's no Walmart around. There's no Black Friday around. There's no Amazon. There's, no, there's nothing. And here they are. Out here is just thinking about their sheep. They, they was probably talking about the weather. They, they might have been talking about the playoffs. I mean, we, we don't know, but I, I'm sure they were just going about their daily routine and not thinking anything about the things of God. And all of a sudden, this angelic host comes to them. That an angel comes and announces the birth. But as he's announcing the birth, an angelic host comes. And in verse 14, saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, 
goodwill towards men. See, the first thing about worship, worship is what connects heaven and earth. Worship is what connects man and God. That was the first thing they said, worship uh, glory to God in the highest. To recognize that God is in heaven. That he is our heavenly father. When we pray the model prayer. When the disciples ask Jesus. Teach us to pray. He said pray in this manner. Our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. So I'm going to tell you today that worship, once again, is one of the most controversial issues. It's the worship teams that always end up having troubles. They're always the ones being attacked. They're always that endure the attacks of the enemy because the enemy hates worship. Why? Because he wants to be worshipped. That's why one of the temptations that he gave Jesus, bow down and worship me. But when we worship, it's our connection to heaven. And it's what brings his kingdom here on earth. See, in the kingdom of heaven, there is nonstop worship of Heavenly Father. If you want the what's going on in heaven brought to earth, worship is what's going on in heaven right now. It is nonstop worship. Worship service in heaven. And therefore, now listen, there's a lot of things here on earth that's not in heaven. There's a lot of sickness on earth that's not in heaven. There's a lot of despair that's on earth that's not in heaven. There's a lot of heartache here on earth that's not in heaven. All the things that the enemy has brought up and brought on about the curse, they're here on earth. But you and I are called for, uh, that his kingdom be done in earth. Uh, this earthen vessel, you and I have a treasure hidden in an earthen vessel. And the only way that I know to bring heaven down to earth is when we worship. God. It is the connection between heaven and earth when we worship. Not necessarily saying songs, but I'm I'm talking about worship and admiration and, and, and adoring him because he is the king. He is the Savior as he was announced to those men that night. So worship is our connection between heaven and earth, between God and man. It is the connection. Worship is also a compass. In verse 14, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go even to Bethlehem and see this which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. Worship is always a compass. Pure worship always points to Jesus. And pure worship always causes you to seek Jesus. So the Bible tells you and I how to even worship. Now, we, once again, we, we know there's a great divide. We, 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 we know that. We're not going to pretend it doesn't exist. And God knew that that would be an issue. So, now listen. I, I want you to listen very carefully. I've got some scripture I want to read to you. In Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Verse 18 says, And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves. Speaking to who? To yourself. In psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We're told in Ephesians that we're to speak to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Then Paul also writes a letter to the church at Colossae and almost repeats the exact same thing. He says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you are called into one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. 
He tells the church in Ephesus to speak to yourselves. Now he's telling the church at Colossae and telling us that we are to admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father even by Him. So this worship thing is not necessarily a church setting. You should be about your day speaking to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then when we come together and and, and corporate worship, we should admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That sounds real good, brother, but what, what's that mean? What does it mean? What's the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? you got to know that God, it, it, God wrote this book in redundant degrees, and every, there's a third level, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. God's stamp uh, earmark is, comes in threes, the body, the spirit, uh, and the soul, which would be, the correct order would be body, soul, and spirit. The third is always the release. It's always the, it always uh, baptized. For example, John, I baptize in water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize in the Holy Ghost and baptize with fire. They're always the third. So Psalms, when we think about Psalms, our mind automatically goes to the book of Psalms. And no doubt that the book of Psalms is a song book. But psalms is actually music that many times words are added to. Now, stay with me. David, who wrote most of the psalms, so therefore we would declare him to be a psalmist, right? When King Saul rebelled against the word of God, and God sent a spirit... A, an, an unclean spirit to torment him. His councilman, his aide said, we need to find somebody who can play skillfully upon the harp. And they go find David. And David, when this unclean spirit would begin to torment King Saul, David would play and Saul would be at peace. Music is very important to your worship atmosphere. I'm going to say that again. Music is very uh, uh, important to your worship atmosphere. And I know some people preach and teach that uh, musical instruments are forbidden in the church today. And so be it. If they don't want no musical instruments in their church, so be it. But I believe to be in correct order with the Lord of God, we need psalms speaking to yourself, uh, ever humming to yourself, making melody in your heart. And that's why many times that sometimes just playing a, a chord, playing something instrumental, many times when you go to pray, I encourage you to put on some instrumental music and begin to let that play in the background. Even the world will tell you when you're studying, put on some classical music and let that Psalms, and yes, Psalms were added words to this music. But I'm telling you, even an anointed psalmist, when somebody plays an organ, somebody plays a piano, somebody plays drums under the anointing and the power of God, it will absolutely cause devils to tremble in their place. It will cause them to be, and man to be at peace. That's why when you get in elevators, there's music playing in the background. That's when you go to doctor's offices. There's music playing in the background to bring a calm and a peace. But I can tell you on the right opposite end, the wrong kind of music can bring torment to you. can cause your mind actually to go crazy. You just can't let anything come in your ear. So Psalms... It's, it's a musical, musical, music written. And yes, when words are added to it, psalms can be a prayer. So we just speak to ourselves, and then we admonish one another in psalms. Sometimes a psalm is prayer. Sometimes it's praise. Sometimes it's a plea. And sometimes it's even prophetic. David wrote more about the Messiah than even Isaiah. 
through his psalms. So psalms is, music is a very important key to the Christian and worship atmosphere. That's why many times before church service starts, you hear somebody play the organ or play the piano. No words. And you need to learn to speak to yourselves. And we need to speak to one another in psalms. And then hymns. Now usually when we talk about hymns, we, our mind automatically goes to the heavenly highway hymn or, or whatever the hymn may, book may be uh, where you attend. We think about songs like Amazing Grace or the Old Rugged Cross and, and which no doubt those are uh, favorites of the faith and should not be taken lightly. But a hymn, a hymn is not nothing new. Hymns were also in the time of Jesus. How do I know that? Because when Jesus ended their supper, when he ended the, 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 meal, the Passover meal with his disciples, the Bible says that they sung a hymn. They sung a hymn. They weren't singing Amazing Grace either. They weren't singing the old rugged cross. I don't know what they were singing, but I know this, they were singing a hymn. And a hymn should be something that blesses God. A hymn should be something that celebrates God. A hymn that should be something that is uh, embodies and exalts and extols and magnifies and praises God. Yes, a psalm does have music and it has words, but it should always point to Jesus. Many of psalms today it points to our struggle and points to Jesus, the answer. And they sung a hymn. Many people want to get away from the hymns. And that's a sad tragedy. Now I'll tell you there's some that we need to get away from. I can tell you there's some contemporary stuff we need to get away from. But I believe to be the total package we have to have psalms, hymns, and then thirdly, spiritual songs. And I believe this is the most important place in the place at the body of Christ. We do pretty good about psalms. We do real good about hymns. And so our spiritual songs is not contemporary uh, worship. It's not, it's not Bethel worship. It's not elevation worship. It, spiritual songs. Is that when all of a sudden the Spirit of God just comes up on you? Or you're just all of a sudden in the shower or you get up in the morning and a song just starts. Somebody better help me this morning. I'm talking about when you get up and all of a sudden something's coming up out of you. And all of a sudden you're singing a song and, and you really don't know where it come from. You ain't heard that song. It's just rising up in you. And you, and you get in it and you go from that song right into another song. And, and, they, and they don't seem like they would go together. But the Spirit of God begins them and they begin to flow out of you. And, you, and in that moment is when you begin to get revelation. You begin to get instruction. Oh yes, and I believe that you and I should get to a place. Paul said, I'll pray. And the understanding and and I'll pray in the spirit he said I'll sing and the understanding I'll sing in the spirit what was he talking about well you got to go back to the next verse he said he that speaketh uh, when he speaketh in an unknown tongue yes I believe the people of God should be singing melodies singing spiritual songs in a heavenly language my God let the Holy Ghost rise up in you sing something unto God sing something that, that will move heaven and the heavens will roll back yes what is it then I'll sing in the understanding and I will sing in the spirit I'm telling you that is spontaneous worship see spontaneous worship is not when you have your songs laid out it's not when you have them laid out in the bulletin with the page number spontaneous and, 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 and spiritual songs is just all of a sudden when it comes upon you and you begin to sing to yourself uh, making melody in your heart and bless God in corporate worship it's when it takes and it takes over the body of Christ and they're in one accord singing the same song in the same chord bless God that is where God God wants you and I to get to. The psalms are good. The hymns are great. But God wants us to the third level of that of singing spiritual songs. Because I'll tell you, a church that don't worship is a church that's stuck. Amen. 
So worship is our connection. It's our compass. And I don't care what kind of song you're singing. If it don't point to Jesus, it don't, has no place in the church. I'm sorry. Some of these things that's duped as and, and put out as gospel music ain't got no more to do with the gospel than what you would hear on a secular radio station. And the same side on, on the contemporary. Some of it has nothing to do. It must, the compass must always point to Jesus. The worship should always point upward, not inward. Worship should always point upward towards Jesus and not inward. And worship has a cause. See, when they heard this angelic host, it caused them to go seek Jesus. And they came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. See, the scripture that tells that you and I, if, if we, if you, if you draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to you. People say, I wish I could get closer to God. You're as close to God as you want to be. I just wish I had a closer walk with God. You're as close as you want to be. Because he said, if you, see, this, this falls on you. This falls on you if you draw nigh to him. He will draw nigh to us. And worship will cause you and I to draw nigh to God. As he draws nigh to you and us. One of the Psalms says this, Psalm 1611. That will show me the path of life, and in thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Why do you and I want to be in the presence of God? Because there in the presence is where the joy is found. I said in his presence is where the joy is is found. And the church should be the joyous people. We sing this time of your joy to the world. But what about joy to the church? What about joy to you and I? Come on now. It starts by praising God. When you're down and out in the mully grubs, when you're feeling depressed and anxious and feel like all hell's coming against you, and you and you got the oh hee haw mentality, bloom despair and agony on me. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Turn that mindset off and begin to do what Isaiah said. He said, "For a spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise." Once again, you're the one that's got to do it. You're the one that's got to lift up your voice. You're the one that's got to let it come out of your inner belly. If you draw nigh to God. See, the, Mary and Joseph wouldn't bring the baby to the shepherds. The shepherds had to go to where the child was, where Christ was. And you and I have to draw nigh to him with our praise. And lastly, there's something very unique. And I once again... I'm not talking about lip service. I'm not talking about going through the motions. I'm talking about genuine praise and worship. In verse 17, and when they heard, and when they seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. See, true worship is contagious. True worship is contagious. You, you got to get past what style of music are we singing. I'm telling you, is God not worthy to be praised? I mean, is God not worthy of our admiration? 
And I can tell you something. When you really get in the atmosphere of praise, it don't matter what they're singing. It don't matter what the format is. It don't matter what style it is. You got to say, well, I don't like some of this new stuff. May I remind you once upon a time, Amazing Grace was a new song, and there was probably people that didn't like it either. Some people probably said, well, that's some of that old modern, some of that modern stuff. I'm telling you what. Pure worship is contagious and it catches on like wildfire. I'm telling you, it's time that the church, I, I'm all about PDA. I'm telling you, it's time that you and I have public display of affection towards Jesus. It's time for the church to clap their hands. It's time for the church to raise their hands. It's time for the church to stomp their feet. It's time for the church to raise their voice and become tank contagious. I'm telling you, when you get in a true atmosphere where Jesus is being lifted up, you can't help but lift your hands. You can't help. You say, well, I, I've never lifted my hands. Well, it's about time. You know how you say, well, it don't really matter how you praise God. Well, I was wrong. I read the book. It does matter how you praise God. He said, lift up your holy hands. It said, with a tambourine, with a psalmery, with your hands, with your voice. My God, let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. I'm telling you, God wants to set an atmosphere of praise that is contagious and will draw men unto him. Is your praise contagious? Is it contagious? When Jesus rode into Jerusalem the last week, his last week on earth, when he rode into Jerusalem, I don't know who started it. But somebody started saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And it wasn't lip service. And it caught on. See, nobody said, here comes Jesus. Let's turn to page 47 in the hymn book. Nobody said, Brian, can you put the words on the wall? All of a sudden, it, it come out of the inner part of man. Hosanna, Hosanna. And the next thing you know, it become contagious. And the, all the people around Jesus, as a matter of fact, they started stripping off their coats. Uh, they went and got palm leaves. I'm telling you, they brought something for this king that was riding in on a donkey. Oh, my God. He brought... And, and, and it was contagious and it got so loud it got so disruptive to the religious folk they said won't you quieten these people down they're getting a little too radical they're getting a little too crazy with the praise won't you do something with them Jesus said I, I could I could go ahead and stop them but the minute I do somebody else uh, the rocks will begin to cry out I'm going to be praised because I'm worthy of it if you don't do it somebody's going to do it for me I'm I'm telling you, our praise should be contagious. Paul and Silas sitting in a jail cell. Here they were beat, they were whipped, they were hung in the lower part of the prison, and they begin to pray and sang songs. And the Bible says, all the prisoners heard. And I'm telling you, it got contagious in there. The prison doors opened an earthquake kit, and nobody left the prison. You let an earthquake open the doors of Hart County Jail today, there'll be some folks walking out of there. Can you say amen? Oh, I didn't you mean we couldn't leave? I thought that mean we could leave. But these prisoners, and I guarantee you they probably didn't have those three squares a meal a day. I know they didn't have TV in this prison. They were in the lower part. They were some people believe and say it was a sewer. I don't know. But I know this. They didn't have nothing to praise about when it looked like when it came to praising. They were, they were beaten. They were in stocks. And it was late at night. And they began to praise. And all the prisoners heard. And nobody went nowhere. I'm going to tell you when you get in the... When, when's the last time you got in a church service? When was the last time that you got in a church service where the praise was, <coughs> was so powerful that nobody wanted to leave, that the Spirit of God constrained you and you didn't care if it was 1 o'clock, 
You didn't care if it was 2 o'clock. You didn't care if it was 3 o'clock. My God, because God was being praised. And that's what happens. In Acts chapter 3, a man goes into the house of God, leaping, praising, and magnifying God. And that got so contagious in the temple. I mean, they've been having dead church services for a long time. And now all of a sudden, somebody comes through the door. They didn't have to be pumped. They didn't have to have the worship of Will you stand to your feet? This man was stood to his feet. Come on now. I mean, he stood to his feet by the power of God. He didn't have to have somebody to pump him, to prime him. He didn't have to have the worship leader. Would you stand to your feet? Would you? He come in. He came in, praising, leaping, and magnifying God. And the Bible says they all come and want to know how come this man could walk. I'm telling you, his praise got contagious. That contagious praise caused 5,000 people to get saved. Now understand, it was G Peter preaching the word that got the people saved. But it was the praise that got their attention. It was the praise that gripped them and captivated them. And Peter preached and said, It's by the name of Jesus that this man walks today. So imagine that night here in that field when those shepherds were told that the Savior had been born. And then all of a sudden an angelic host came and begin to worship God. Can I tell you something? If I understand scripture right. They said born to you this day in the city of David is a savior. But if I understand the Bible right. The Bible says they are curious to look in. To salvation. They're curious. They, they don't understand salvation like you and I do. You, 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 you Surely you see where I'm about to go with this, right? If they could leave the portals of heaven and begin to praise and magnify God for a Savior which was born unto you this day and them not even understand the full ramifications of what God was doing through this holy child Jesus, how much more should you and I step out of what we feel comfortable and lift up our voice, uh, lift up our hands, step our feet, clap our hands, do a little jig, if you will, unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Above all else, our Savior. Stand with me if you would. See, worship has to start with you.